Hey Saints, just a quick video today. Um, the Lord pointed something out to me, and it's like the extreme obvious, uh, but it's probably significant. So, uh, what he pointed out to me was Acts 2 is Pentecost, and yeah, that's a deep revelation, but. Um, it goes hand in hand with the uh, other video video or videos I did before where we were looking at Peter's declaration on the day of Pentecost and the his I won't say weird but his interesting quoting of Joel 2 when he did it and so let's just go down read down Acts 2 and then I'll show you why I think this might be interesting. Um, I guess there's a preface to this. People have watched my channel kind of since the beginning. Um, I've been looking for where is timing wise the rapture in the Bible. And the more obvious things to look at, of course, is the feasts of the Lord. And I'm sure I've got a video where I've at least taking a look at almost all of them or all of them including the Jubilee you know and, and its relation to Yom Kippur and the whole thing and probably what you've noticed is I never rule anything out because I do advocate for the doctrine of imminence and that is I think the most scriptural view of the rapture which is awesome because we can expect the Lord at any moment and I think that keeps our hearts in the right places and, you know, uh, expectant heart uh, to eagerly await the coming of our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. You know, those types of passages, if you're eagerly awaiting, I think it has some to do. And you're supposed to know the signs of the times, First Thessalonians 5, and the, we won't be caught in darkness because we're not children of darkness but of light, First Thessalonians 5. All of those statements in the Bible to me say not only is it perfectly okay to be looking for the timing or the coming of the Lord, not to the day necessarily, but, you know, looking for when is it, Lord? <laughs> When's it going to be? And I think also that earnest expectation and looking through the passages of the Bible teach us the Bible as we're anxiously awaiting his return. If you're passive about all of this stuff, you're missing all the great Bible studies, in my mind, of trying to understand. You know, I wouldn't have been into the feasts of the Lord if I wasn't trying to figure out uh you know, the Lord's next coming. I guess I probably would have read them, but it's just been, you know, endless education trying to figure out what it, what were the feasts telling us? Who were they for? Is it setting a pattern? Can we expect anything? And so I think it's perfectly acceptable, if not warranted in in the attitude of our heart that the Bible guides us toward studying these things out and trying to figure it out but I'll just say right now if you're somebody that has gone up and down the roller coaster expecting that on this feast of trumpets or on that day of Pentecost or whatever the rapture was going to happen and you got severely disappointed when it didn't then then these videos aren't for you mine uh, that look into this and other people's you got to adjust, I think, your your mentality. How do you hold, you know, onto dates and times loosely, but but have that anxiousness for the Lord? If you can't get your head there yet, um, I think you probably should avoid these videos and stick with your Bible study. And that's probably a better place for you, so you don't get the disappointment. So with all that said, you know, I've, in terms of backing away from different feasts and time frames, 
the first one I started walking back from was the Feast of Trumpets. Not that it isn't possible in a Feast of Trumpets. You can make biblical arguments toward it. But as I dug through all of these different things, I think the last three feasts, Feast of Trumpets, Yom Kippur and Tabernacles, are all at the second coming of Jesus when he actually comes to the earth and he sets up the messianic reign here on earth or millennial reign um, and that's for a number of reasons so I've been backing away from those and the first three had been fulfilled you know at Jesus first coming and I've had a couple of videos where I've been debating Pentecost because it looks like the dispensations change at Pentecost throughout history and you know, it, it did at the formation of the church. Wouldn't that be a logical ending for the church to be raptured up on Pentecost? And this is what was rolling through my brain here. Um, you know, a lot of people are looking at Christmas time frame here, mostly from the pagan point of view. Uh, if you dig into Christmas and the Christmas tree and the light on the Christmas tree and Santa Claus and what that meant, in the Norse tradition and where that came from, you end up, as always, back at the next coming of Nimrod, back at the original Babylon before, or I mean just after the flood. And yes, everything tracks back there. I'm not just a broken record. <laughs> Go start digging into those things. You'll you'll be amazed at the Yule log and the Christmas tree and all of those trappings and the, you know, the evergreens and the holly and the whole thing goes back to that original Babylonian religious system. And so, yeah, Christmas was just one more of those deals that, you know, the paganism got merged with the church back there under Constantine and after in the 300s AD. And so the birth of Christ not being perfectly known, getting merged into something that made it comfortable for the Roman pagan system of the day, it got smacked onto the time frame of, you know, the sun cycles and the, you know, shortest day of the year moving to the into the days getting longer and that being the rebirth, the sun rebirth period uh, that's tied to Tammuz. And so, yeah, even Christmas in an odd way is um, a possibility for the rapture of the church because it's picturing in pagan tradition the birth of the Antichrist. And so if those two events are tied, the timing of the church going and the Antichrist being revealed as in what we might be seeing there in Revelation 6 at the first seal, or in the way it's stated in 2 Thessalonians 2, where the falling away in the King James, you know, may be better understood in the prior English translations as the, the, departure, definite article, departure, and then the appearing of the Antichrist. <clears throat> if those are that related, then maybe seeing that birthing, if you want to say, the Antichrist may give you some timing clues as to why Christmas and the solstices and all that were so important in the pagan tradition. So set that aside. Bonk. <clears throat> Let's take a look at Pentecost and rule, <laughs> I'm not going to say rule it out as a rapture time frame, but see why it may not be the rapture of the church, um, that it might be something something else. And so let's get into it now with all that. Um, I'm going to read down Acts 2 and I'm going to stop after Peter finishes quoting Joel and then make our point. Uh, and it's... You know, we're going to read down through Acts 2, 20, 22, that, in that range there. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. 
And there appeared unto them cloven tongues as fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled sorry, with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And uh, there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. And this is really important. This is Shavuot. Shavuot. Um, and now when this noise abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia. Phygria and Pamphylia and Egypt and the parts of Libya about the Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues and wonderful works of God. <clears throat> and they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying to one another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words, for these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Here we go. <clears throat> and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Then the sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. Okay, and the point <laughs> that I made in the prior video was, it's interesting because here's the outpouring of the Spirit, and what Peter is quoting is this last day's passage, when yes, the Spirit is poured out, and so, okay, there may be some relationship there because the last days can mean this final age, uh, but I think there's something deeper here because he doesn't just quote the parts in Joel that talk about the outpouring of the Spirit. He goes on and he says, I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall turn to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And in the prior video, I was making the point, that doesn't make sense, does it? <laughs> the day of Pentecost, back there, the time Peter quoted this, there was no signs in the in the heaven and the earth. There wasn't blood and fire and vapor of smoke, and the sun didn't turn to darkness, and the moon didn't turn to blood. Uh, and it wasn't right at the great notable day of the Lord. So why did he quote all that? And as we got into it, you know, I found the parallels to this passage and was sitting there in Revelation 6. Okay, in Revelation 6, starting verse 12, And I beheld when he opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon as blood. Well, that's when, that's, you know, <laughs> the last days, and that's when this event happens. Stars from heaven fell to the earth, and great fig as even as a fig tree cat does her and timely figs when she is shaken by a mighty wind and the heavens depart as a scroll there's the you know events in the heavens and every mountain and island were moved out of their places and the kings of the earth and the great men the rich men the chief captains and the mighty men even the bondmen and the free men hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. 
for the great day of his wrath has come. So that's, you know, that's what he was quoting is the sun becoming black, the moon to blood before the great day of the Lord has come. And so this is the ending part. So Peter was quoting the outpouring of the spirit at the beginning of the church age. We know the rapture is the end of the church age. But if you read the rest of Acts 2, what is Peter doing? He is the witness in the earth for the Lord Jesus Christ. What is this? This is the final witness in the earth from the Gentiles of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it is. Then it picks up with the Jewish program starting right away in Revelation 7. Let's just go Revelation 7. I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor the sea, nor any tree. And I saw an angel descending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and cried with a loud voice, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we seal the servants of our God in their foreheads, and then the 144,000 of the children of Israel are sealed. And so that's the perfect beginning and ending, right? It started with the Jews assembled at the time of Shavuot and the outpouring happened of the Holy Spirit of Pentecost. And I think what Peter was doing is it was ending then with the sun turning to dark and the moon to blood before the great and notable day of the Lord comes is when it all ends. And so the testimony of Christ in the earth, you know, right as Peter stood up and talked, that was the beginning of the church. The rapture is the end of the church age. We go to heaven. What happens after the rapture of the church? Many people are going to be left behind. And that's what we see in seal five is the last gasp of the people that probably thought they were part of the church but missed the rapture, the tribulation saints being persecuted in seal 5 because they had the testimony. Let's just find that here. Hang on. In verse 9, And when he opened the fifth seal, he saw under the altar souls of them that were slain for the word of God, for the testimony that they had. And so there's the end, if you want to say, of the church testimony in earth. Now, I'll say the Gentile slash church, the church that believed in God went in the rapture, but all those that missed it get one last chance to have their testimony in earth. Now, they're persecuted here because they cried with a loud voice, How long, O Lord, doth thou now judge and avenge our blood that dwell on earth? And so they, they die for their testimony. But that's the ending of the church witness in the earth uh, or the Gentile witness in the earth and then as I was pointing out right away in, in Revelation 7 you've got the testimony transitioning to all the tribes of the children of Israel the 144,000 the outpouring of the Spirit as they're sealed that's the perfect symmetry of Acts and <laughs> what struck me this morning is that's Pentecost uh, so I would just say, saints, that that we're probably looking at Pentecost happening. You know, the day of Pentecost, maybe either in regards to the sun going dark and the moon to blood, or potentially the beginning here of Revelation 7:1. And I, I don't know if what that span of time would be, but wouldn't that make sense that if Peter was saying that the day of Pentecost, the transition, as all of them had been in terms of the dispensation, was happening on that day of Pentecost. The transition that we see again now for that witness of Christ in the earth is at the end of Revelation 6 and the beginning verses of Revelation 7. That's Pentecost. Uh, you know, so to state, <laughs> state the obvious, to me, that puts a little bit more weight on this notion of the church rapture is not pictured in the feasts. So that's where I come now. 
that goes back to the doctrine of imminence. Um, you know, I kind of hate looking at the pagan traditions to figure out how does that relate to the church. But, you know, just timing wise, if that pagan solstice uh, worship practice had something to do with the rebirth of Nimrod or Tammuz into the future here, if the church is tied to, you know, if the church leaves right as that event is going to happen, this might be the right time of year uh, for the church to go. But um, that'll just be a wonderful Christmas present, saints, if that <laughs> if that happens this Christmas or any other Christmas. But um, just thought you'd find this interesting. Acts two, Acts two is Pentecost. <laughs> Uh, God bless you, saints. Have a wonderful day in the Lord.